These are African rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythm, just get down. Get on. African Liberation Day has its origins in the milieu of anti-colonial movements that took place across the African continent. Delegates at the first Conference of Independent African States, convened by Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and held in Accra in 1958, called for an African Freedom Day to be held on April 15th to honor those who had contributed to the anti-colonial struggle. Later in 1963, with the founding of the Organization of African Unity in Addis Ababa, African Freedom Day became African Liberation Day. Commemorated on May 25th, the purpose of African Liberation Day was to draw attention to and support the struggles against colonialism, imperialism, and white supremacy across Africa as well as throughout the African diaspora. At the founding of the OAU, Kwame Nkrumah stood before 31 heads of African states and declared, the struggle against colonialism does not end with the attainment of national independence. Independence is only the prelude to a new and more involved struggle for the right to conduct our own economic and social affairs, unhampered by crushing and humiliating neo-colonialist controls and interference. The clarity of Nkrumah's thought is further articulated as he was very clear to point out that while African peoples were throwing off the yoke of colonialism, it must not be lost that these successes were equally matched by the intense effort on the part of imperialism to continue the exploitation of our resources by creating divisions amongst us. For Kwame Nkrumah, we must unite or perish. Nkrumah, alongside other leaders, proposed to build a pan-Africanist vision of a continent united under a common currency, monetary zone, and central bank, and a united government and joint defense under an African high command. However, the coming decades will see African leaders assassinated and overthrown in coups, backed by colonial powers for daring to envision a life of dignity for their people. Meanwhile, international financial institutions dominated by these very forces implemented brutal programs such as structural adjustment, which sank African countries further into debt and exploitation. While the Organization of African Unity eventually became the African Union and African Liberation Day became Africa Day, May 25th still serves as a crucial mechanism for progressive forces to connect and strategize against inequitable and dehumanizing conditions. While it is argued that the ideas and principles of liberation that propelled the formation of the Organization of African Unity has since been removed in letter and even in spirit from official commemorations of the day, the current global conditions that are direct products from historical inequities, inherent in racial capitalist relationships, a more intentional focus on study that informs the work to address the false narratives of the post-colonial is rising across the African continent with collectives such as the Kenyan Organic Intellectuals Network as well as throughout the Americas and Europe. There is a rising tide. But this opportunity also presents the lingering challenge, one that is rooted in dangerous symbolism and empty overtures. In a speech reflecting on the importance and meaning of African Liberation Day delivered in San Francisco, California, Walter Rod asserted that there is an illusion that must be squashed. And that is when we support Africa, we are supporting foreign entities. We are escaping from the struggle here, but the support of Africa is merely an extension of the struggle here. The struggle is universal because the system of oppression is universal. The struggle is international and black unity must be international because we are the world's most authentic international people. 
This time is a symbolic act of coming together. This is also a time for self-analysis and self-criticism and a rededication. So we will go from here with a new strength. We will reconsider the nature of the domestic struggle and its relation to the international struggle, moving towards the realization that the system must fall. It all must fall. Have no illusions about it. The system that was created within this country as it extends throughout the world is so immoral, so vicious, that there is no compromise. There is no remedy except to banish it. Today, we explored the continuities of African Liberation Day with Obi Igbuna Jr. Obi Igbuna Jr. was born in London, England, and raised in Washington, D.C., spending time in Nigeria. Obi is a founding member of the Pan-African Liberation Organization established in Washington, D.C. from 1990 to 2007. And in addition to organizing and speaking engagement, Obi is a journalist, African history teacher, and playwright. Obi is correspondent to the Herald, Zimbabwe's national newspaper, and the first U.S. correspondent in the country's 30-plus years as an independent nation. Obi has taught African history at Roots Public Charter School since 1990 and has also taught at Ujima School and Northwest High School in Prince George's County. Obi is the founding member and executive director of the Mass Emphasis Children History and Theater Company and has written several resolutions and appeals to the United Nations, World Health Organization, and Southern African Development Community. Obi has also organized calling for the unconditional and immediate lifting of U.S.-EU sanctions on Zimbabwe, as well as the lifting of the blockade on Cuba. In addition to forging his own path, Obi worked directly with Kwame Torre the last eight years of his life and is son of Obi Igbuna Sr., who is a Nigerian-born novelist, playwright, and political activist, and was a leading member of the Universal Colored People's Association and the British Black Power and Black Panther Movement. Obi's father's book, Destroy This Temple, The Voice of Black Power in Britain, has been re-released and is currently available from Black Classic Press. Shirley Graham Du Bois, in a review of Destroy This Temple, The Voice of Black Power in Britain, in the 1972 volume of The Black Scholar, wrote that, here is a book that all of us will find extremely valuable. By all, I mean every African, every person of African descent, whatever he or she may be, and everyone who is aware that something is basically wrong with the relations of human beings on this earth. People not aware of this fact are either too stupid or too arrogantly complacent for it to matter. Our show was produced today in solidarity with the native, indigenous, African, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Corporation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, Brazil, the Avalon Village in Detroit, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, Ghana, Haiti, and other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Listen intently, think critically, act accordingly. Enjoy the program. Joined by Obi Igbuna Jr. Uh, once again to the platform. Thank you, and welcome to the platform again, Obi. Pleasure to be here. So uh, today we are going to be discussing uh, the the African Liberation Day in a broader context, uh, in a continuation of the decolonization process, but also more importantly, uh, the work that you are intending to do or that you are doing. Uh, in this particular tradition of our ancestors and elders who uh, were very, very important in establishing African Liberation Day as a pan-African uh, vehicle uh, for African people across the world to understand that this decolonization process and this notion of a post-colonial uh, is a myth. Uh, decolonization is a decolonization and anti-colonization are two interdependent components because decolonization we can say is the removal of the colonization apparatus but anti-colonialism is the continued struggle against the reassertion of mm -hmm. the colonial apparatus so with that being said that was just my opening remarks and i'm going to open the floor um and you can jump right in um and begin wherever you would like again thank you for joining us african liberation day obi what it's does it a, mean to you oh uh, it's a way of life um I marched in African Liberation Day when I was nine years old in 1979, nine turned to 10. So I marched with um, Kwame Ture and other members of the All African People's Revolutionary Party 
And we'd like to thank the All African People's Revolutionary Party who, hell above high water, always um, organizes African Liberation Day all over the world, throughout the diaspora and throughout the continent in as many places as they have an active presence. So, um, and we think that's important because we know that right now in North America, unfortunately, there are people who go all out to celebrate Kwanzaa, but when it comes to African Liberation Day, they act like they're fugitives running from the FBI and they go in hiding. And we think that that's the wrong message to send to our babies because arguably one of the most intense challenges of the decolonization process, which you so eloquently mentioned, is making our cultural and political expression synonymous. We don't want um, political expression that's militant, that's anti-imperialist, that's red, black, and green, red, gold, and green, and all the colors of our different African flags, but our cultural expression be Yankee Doodle Dandy, red, white, and blue apple pie, and un an apologetic for us looking to deal with resistance. So from its inception on April 15th, 1958, coming out of the All African People's Conference, which was a breakthrough in our strategic planning, because at the end of that conference, Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah circulates a resolution saying that all liberation movements seeking to eradicate colonialism through positive action must have the unconditional support of everyone there. But a young Frantz Fanon stands up and says, what about those of us involved in armed struggles? And so the resolution goes back around and armed struggles are included. So between 1957 and 1960, 35 nations get their independence. A few years ago, President Obama said that Arab Spring was the most rapid swing towards progress Obviously, his history book was a weapon of mass destruction. It was those that those 35 nations gaining independence in three years, that's the most rapid swing. And Dr. King confirms it in his letter to, from the Birmingham jail, where he says that the anti-colonial movement is moving like a jet, where the movement to end modern day desegregation desegrega was moving like a horse attached to a buggy. So we've always used that vehicle and the fight to make resistance the cornerstone of our narrative as opposed to victimization. So for the last six years, the Mass Emphasis Children's History and Theater Company has felt obligated to do something on African Liberation Day. And we always do a post-African Liberation Day celebration so we don't conflict with anyone else. So we wait till it's over, we wait till it's concluded. Last year, we had an incredible seminar with you in your professorial capacity at Winston-Salem State. And we had the Eritrean ambassador to the United States, the Cuban ambassador to the United States, the main advisor to Venezuela's National Assembly, the leader of the Zimbabwe anti-sanctions movement talk about sanctions. So here we are following up this year with a play, with a video tribute to the great Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel movement. Maurice Bishop who led the most important revolution in the Caribbean through the New Jewel movement, because we don't separate fighters from their organizations. Um, the most important revolution in the Caribbean since the Cuban revolution in 1959 and going back to the Haitian revolution in 1804. So uh, we wanted to pay homage to him. This year is the 40th anniversary of his assassination. And of course, we wanted to pay homage to the great Paul Robeson at a time when many of our people treat the 1960s like it's the Garden of Eden. So when they think of a protest artist, they think of Dick Gregory first. They think of Eartha Kitt. They think of Colin Kaepernick. They think of um, some of these artists. But Paul Robeson gave up a career making $250,000 a year as an actor and a baritone singer, the best of the century. He went from making $250,000 a year to $6,000 a year. And it was because of his work with the Civil Rights Congress. It was because of his work with the Council on African Affairs. And for the record, the Council of African Affairs is the first organization in our community to establish direct ties to the African National Congress. So for those who come 40 years after claiming to start the anti-apartheid movement, they either had an ego problem or they chose to be historically dismissive because that was the order of the day. So no, 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 no. So we wanted to pay working tribute and the Paul Robeson play will culminate in children paying homage to him in 11 languages. Um, Lingala in the Congo, Mende in Sierra, spoken in Sierra Leone, 
Igbo spoken in Nigeria, Lingala, I said Lingala, um, Kiswahili spoken in Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, Igbo spoken in Nigeria, potentially Mugamo spoken in the Cameroon, Norwegian, English, Spanish, French, and Patois spoken in Jamaica. So that's how these children, they're gonna pay homage to Paul Ropes in, in these languages. And I can't describe it any further than that, but I hope that's enough to entice you to tune in. Yeah, could you, at, at, at this particular moment before we kind of unpack, cause you, what you did was lay out uh, African Liberation Day as a platform, as a vehicle to continue the work that, again, uh, anti-colonialists were uh, um, attempting to uh, free African people wherever they are, but centered on the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. Give us, give our listeners a little bit more at this point in our conversation. It's very good for us to go ahead and give us information about how listeners can tap into uh, this offer. Yes, um, my Twitter account is at J-R E G. B U N A. Ed Junior Egbuna. My Instagram is at O B I E G B U N A 15. Email address O B I E G B U N A 15 at gmail.com. And between those three vehicles, they should be able to get the Zoom link so they could come on. If they want to come on with school students, if they're educators listening and you'd like your school students to see children between 5 to 18 do these performances, you could come on at 1.30 East Coast um, Thursday, June 1st. If you're in the community, you can come on on June 2nd at 7.30 East Coast time. And I'd like to use this opportunity to thank our co-sponsors, Dr. Anthony Browder of the Institute of Karma Guidance, our sister Adua and the uh, Wisdom Wednesday Collective, um, the Woodson Banneker Division of the UNIA, um, our sister uh, Dr. Afia and Africatown in Mobile, Alabama, and our brother for life, Maurice Carney, out of the um, the executive director of Friends of the Congo. We've worked with Maurice since 1995, where we met during the Million Man March. So, um, and oh, and Hood Communists, our young warriors, um, who uh, remind us so much of ourselves 30 years ago, who are stepping up to the plate. And one of the children in the play, Zion Kane, who's nine years old, I believe, his mother, Erica Kane, is um, affiliated with Hood Communists and affiliated with Black Alliance for Peace. But Black Alliance for Peace is not a co-sponsor, but Hood Communists is a co-sponsor. So thank you to all our co-sponsors who feel the way we do, that African Liberation Day leads the way in ensuring that we make resistance the cornerstone of our narrative, not victimization. We're right. seeking liberation, not garnering sympathy from our enemies. Right. And, and again, you know, our listeners absolutely can can tap into that. Uh, but let's back up just a little bit. You mentioned Maurice Bishop, you mentioned Eritrea, you mentioned Cuba, you mentioned mm -hmm. uh, uh, Paul Robeson, you mentioned mm -hmm. the, C the Council on African Affairs. Uh, it's mm -hmm. again, one of the progenitors, one of the originators in really solidifying in this tradition of Pan-Africanism, right? This Pan-African Congress attempting to solidify uh, relationships to uh, uh, impact the material conditions of people on the African continent in relation to the material conditions of Africa, the people here in the Americas, in particular here in the United States with the Council on African Affairs. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, the uh, the connection. Talk a little bit more because, again, let's start with Maurice Bishop and the importance of the New Jewel Movement uh, and African Liberation Day. Um, talk a little bit more and kind of unpack these threads that you kind of laid out here yeah. uh, well, in the context. Sure. When we talk about um, the the young people who were in Britain on the heels of the Fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945, which Paul Robeson was physically present at with his wife, Eslanda Robeson. So he was there with George Padmore. He was there with Osaja for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He was there with W.E.B. Du Bois. He was there with um, Amy Ashwood Garvey and Amy Jacques Garvey. 
And this is five years after the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey transitions to the ancestors from London. So the groundwork in that room laid uh, the direction for the militant anti-imperialist direction of the anti-colonial movement. So we pay homage there. So, but in the case of Maurice Bishop, we're talking about the most impactful revolution in the Caribbean since Cuba in um, 1959 and Haiti in 1804. Um, the reason Maurice Bishop was assassinated is because the false propaganda that Grenada, an island of 88,000 people, were going to stash Cuban and Russian missiles on, next to their airport. They had 88,000 people, so they were going to militarily provoke a nation with 233 million people. So we're saying to you, let logic guide you. Let logic prevail. The real reason was because of something that happened 21 years ago, before that. A directive from John F. Kennedy, where after the Bay of Pigs invasion failed, the CIA's attempted an invasion of Cuba. One year later, they imposed the blockade on Cuba. And he says Cuba is dangerous to him, not because of its ability to maintain itself, but because it will inspire others to have a socialist revolution inside of the Americas. So Salvador Allende in Chile, 10 years before the assassination of Maurice Bishop is disposed of, um, 10 years before the um, blockade on Cuba was imposed, Maha, um, Jacobo Arbenz in Guatemala, his government was disposed of. The United States is heavily invested in regime change in Venezuela right now, heavily invested in regime change in Mexico and Peru for that reason. They do not want anti-imperialist socialist entities to be at the helm of power. And they considered, according to Maurice Bishop, when he spoke in Medgar Evers College, he said, they'll tell you we're dangerous because we speak English, which is a whole nother, uh, which is the reason they feared Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, which is the reason they feared uh, Robin Mugabe, the late president of Zimbabwe because nothing got lost in translation when articulated and conveyed by those men on behalf of their nations, on behalf of their revolutions. So this was the same thing that our brother Maurice Bishop was subjected to. And this point becomes very important, the language and the linguistic and being able to, to, to transmit those ideas, which again, the play that you, are, that you have constructed is centered around you know, uh, uh, the, the platform of being able to talk to each other um, and transmit the ideas uh, that are carried through language it becomes very, very important. Thank you for mentioning that because we don't want, we, we would love it if everyone just woke up one day and spoke Igbo. But if you're promoting neo-colonialism in Igbo, that's a setback. We would love it if you talk Shonen and Debele like they do in Zimbabwe. But if you talk neo-colonialism, it doesn't matter if it's in the indigenous tongue or the mother tongue. We would love it if you could all speak Lingala like you've been in the DRC all your life. But are you talking the language of resistance? And there are many in our community who want our children to appreciate the struggle, celebrate the struggle, but that does not mean that they want them to be involved in the struggle. And what this is, is another part of the decolonization process, because our illustrious history of service, our illustrious history of sacrifice, our illustrious history of resistance is really highlighting and magnifying people who were the exception in the space and time they occupied. So what we're trying to do is turn the um, exception into the norm and the norm into the exception. Let opportunists be the exception. Let traitors be the exception. Let uh, cowards be the exception. Let saboteurs be the exception. And let fighters of Bishop's caliber, of Thomas Sankara's caliber, of Samora Marshall's caliber. These are the Africans we lost in the 80s. And I say that to those of you who treat the 1960s like Christians treat the Garden of Eden and you don't look at anything after the 60s. Look who we lost in the 80s. We lose Walter Rodney in 1980. We lose Maurice Bishop in 83. We lose Samora Marshall on the same day, three years later in 1986. And we lose Thomas Sankara and Burkina Faso in 1987. And we would have lost Muammar Gaddafi in 1986 if Reagan's bombers were more accurate. 
So this is something that we should think about. And it is said that when Thomas Sankara and Maurice Bishop met, they both in private said they didn't think they'd ever meet again alive. So just like Brother Malcolm knew death was at his door, just like Dr. King knew the death was at his door, these brothers knew that death was at their door. We do not say that to romanticize death, but it shows their fearlessness and their selflessness that they were going to make contributions all the way till their last drop of blood and their last breath of air, because they understood that that came with the territory. Yeah, and one of the things that um, you know, uh, this is when this is when the conversation just you know begins to to evolve and take form on its own is that one of the most important you just mentioned a, an important historical fact that like you cannot take away that the eighties loss was a was a direct assault on the African world abroad and at home right of course people associate the eighties here. With the crack epidemic, um, you know those, you know those things that, of course, move us into the '90s. But the context that you just laid out now, it cannot be lost that there was there was again the notion of abroad and at home, of fighting for freedom at, abroad and fighting for freedom at home, is something that comes out of the the radicalist movements that was happening even before then. Go ahead. And I'm glad. And I'm glad. Growing up in D.C. at the height of the PCP and crack cocaine era. Um, there's another point. Um, at some point, I'd like to have a conversation with our brother Freeway Ricky Ross, because when the CIA, of course, the CIA put crack cocaine in South Central Los Angeles, and we had this conversation with Dick Gregory back in 1998, when we were young organizers in a group called the Pan-African Student Youth Movement, and we had a project called the King Muhammad Anti-Military Project, and Dick Gregory, of course, was dealing with crack cocaine in the CIA, but when we had a phone conversation with him, we said, Mr. Gregory, they put crack in South Central LA so that they could maintain aggression towards Nicaragua, the nation with the largest African population in Central America, and an organization that dismantled a neo-colonialist family operation where they were ran, the country was ran by Somoza and his family since the 19th, for 70 years. So what Papa Doc and Baby Doc did in Haiti, the Somozas did in Nicaragua. And those are Spanish speaking Africans in Nicaragua that were compromised by that. So when you talk about the drugs and then what people need to understand, the difference between capitalism and socialism even has an environmental dimension to it. How do you use the earth? The coca plant as used by Bolivians, as used by Peruvians, as used by Colombians, is for senior citizens to deal with arthritis and their digestive system. That is how that plant is used. So when the United States talks about a war on drugs and flying to those nations to exterminate those crops, that is biological warfare because they know the real reason that those crops are used. And the um, Bolivians, the Colombians, and the Peruvians have consistently conveyed that message to the world. This is what we use the coca plant for. We don't use it like um, Dexter Manley used it. We don't use it like Leon Spinks used it. We don't use it like so many entertainers and so many everyday Africans who have succumbed to those deadly drugs use them. They are used for humanitarian purposes. Going back to what the Native Americans say, that earth the planet is an extension of God. It's God's finest creation, arguably. So to be one with earth is to be one with God, to be one with peace, to be one with compassion, to be one with the just orders of the day. So whenever we bring this up and going back to Cuba, a lot of my friends did not know that the movie Scarface was an anti-Cuba movie. If you know anything about movies, the original Scarface movie was made by Howard Hanks in 1932. It was about Al Capone. How does it shift 51 years later to be focused on a Cuban immigrant named Tony Montana? At the beginning of the movie is Comandante Fidel speaking about the, Mon um, the Mario boat lift and how if Cubans weren't willing to adapt to the spirit of the revolution and they missed the days where Maya Lansky had Cuba looking like Vegas and um, Atlantic City, a time where whorehouses were the order of the day, where drug houses, trap houses, as, you, as the young folks call them, were the order of the day. 
And when the revolution prevailed, those trap houses and casinos turned into hospitals, schools, and homes. So this is what um, Tony Montana was vehemently against, played by Al Pacino. So he spent like five minutes trashing Cuba. So this is something to be very mindful of, how um, what they have done for the world in comparison to what their detractors have done for the world. And you'll be, and as a matter of fact, one of the main programs that we've been pushing vehemently, you yourself as well, we've been urging our young people to go to the Latin American School of Medical Sciences to Cuba for a six year program to get a scholarship worth $250,000 in US currency. And they would go to Cuba and they would come back to the poorest communities in Baltimore, the poorest communities in LA, the poorest communities in DC, in Chicago, in Uniontown, Alabama, where people are living on $11,000. And um, they would apply their trade, continuing to work of Booker T. Washington, who started Negro Health Month before he left us. And one of Dr. Du Bois' best sociological studies was the physique and health of the Negro American. So based on that, um, but we found out, Dr. Pope and listeners, that Maurice Bishop in the New Jew Movement had 700 U.S. students studying, being trained to be doctors in Grenada, being trained by Cuban doctors, ironically. So the program that many people have been pushing, Maurice Bishop and the New Jew Movement already had it going on in Grenada. Another reason Maurice Bishop is so important today is because he gave a speech in 1979 called The New Tourism, and he highlighted the fact if you prioritize a good time for your tourist more than the needs of your citizens, you're going to undermine the fabric of your nation. You're going to kill the spirit of patriotism. So at a time where all of you are going to Ghana, like gamblers go to Las Vegas and go to Atlantic City, you should think about that, that a Kufa Ado, who took the liberty of changing Founders Day from Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's birthday, which is spitting on the face of that tradition of resistance. And he's saying that when the United Gold Coast Convention was founded, that should be Founders Day, which didn't liberate the country and was not ain't, whose aim was not to eradicate colonialism, but to make colonial reforms. The same way some of you want to make police terrorism reforms, housing reforms, healthcare reforms, education reforms. And if you were in the plantations with our ancestors, you might have been fighting for a better roof on the shacks. You might have been complaining about you should choose between picking tobacco and cotton. You shouldn't pick both. Or you would have been fighting for shorter work hours, not from sun up to sundown, but maybe the eight hour work week we have today. You would have been involved in captivity reform, commonly referred to as slavery reform. So the fact they had a revolution and they were dealing with these things and our people had free education in Grenada from 79 to 83, free healthcare in Grenada from 79 to 83, free housing in Grenada from 79 to 83. And their women's empowerment was becoming the model of the English speaking, the Caribbean and English speaking African nations. But he said that tourism can't be your GDP because if your hotels have air conditioned, if your visitors have food, the finest food that you have on your in your nation, but your everyday citizens don't have clean drinking water. Your everyday citizens don't have electricity. Your everyday citizens don't have food. What type of message are you sending to the citizens of your nation that showing visitors a good time is more important than the needs of a nation? So he was one of the very first to talk talk about that. And then he talked about how no nation in the Americas should allow themselves to be treated as imperialism's backyard. And of course, his the New Jewel Movement's ties to the PLO, the New Jewel Movement's ties to Cuba, the New Jewel Movement's ties to the Sandinistas. There's a beautiful picture of Maurice Bishop and Samora Marshall, who were assassinated the same day, three years apart. The New Jewel Movement's support for the liberation movements in Southern Africa at a time where Southern Africa only had two, na three nations that were independent, Mozambique, Angola, and Zimbabwe, but South Africa was still, what's called South Africa was still embroiled in armed struggle. What's called Namibia was fighting to break the shackles of German colonialism. 
So he was definitively clear, and he was only 39 years old when they snatched him from us, the same age Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was on April 4th, 1968, when he was assassinated at the Lorraine Hotel, 701 Central Time in the evening, and the same time that Brother Malcolm, the same age Brother Malcolm was when he was assassinated three years before at the Audubon Ballroom on February 21st, 1965. So Maurice Bishop is another 39 that we lost as we and, lost so many great fighters in their 30s. So it's very important to remember what he stood for and how the Caribbean can resurrect that character of resistance and move to fight for what the Grenadian people had. And one of the things that I, that is important in the context of each of these, if even if we were to look at the periodization of each of these, when uh, when certain uh, uh, leaders were taken away, or uh, but as one of the things that you said earlier is that we do not separate and should not separate the 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 person from the organization. That becomes important because that is how we continue on the spirit of fighting. And moving from the 80s to the 90s, and, we, and, and we've and we been talking about this at least for a few years to really focus on, you know, that that transition period from the 80s to the 90s and what was happening in the 90s, because there was an attempt. We saw it through hip hop. We saw it through, you know, this this notion of connecting through Africa, through hip hop, the rediscovery and the connection to uh, to jazz or a.k.a. jazz, black classical music. Or We saw this. So one of the things that I think is important to highlight as we kind of put a pin in our conversation is to talk about the movements and and the it, and the attempts of people to organize themselves in these particular traditions because we're at this point now right we're in the 2000s we see a re uh, inscription of these inequitable power relations. We see some of the same tactics that are being used um, and those types of things. So as someone who's who's have, who's a longtime organizer and who, is, who has been continuously doing work, and because of that, you are connected with groups across the world. Uh, you know, that's how we discovered ourselves, do work. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, do work, try to find each other, you mm -hmm. know, and then Next thing you know, we work, we work, and then we we bump shoulders and we're continuing that work. Talk about just a little bit of a teaser of this transition, the 90s, the, the 90s and the importance of the continuation <sighs> of this. Of this uh, well, um, let me just, if you remember um, during the uh, George Floyd uprisings, as they are called, Don Lemon was having a conversation with Jane Fonda. And she's talked about how the George Floyd uprising was beautiful in comparison to the Rodney King uprisings, which we were part of, because those were rooted in rage and anger. And as we know, whenever our resistance takes on the nationalist and pan-Africanist character, white liberals, the likes of Jane Fonda, run for the border. So, um, but what I would say about the 90s and now is the younger people coming into being introduced to struggle at this point, they have the same challenge that we had. We must be the beneficiaries of our resistance. We shut down this country in response to the Rodney King verdict. The main bishop beneficiary was William Jefferson Clinton when he became president. The Million Man March, we had two million men on the mall and anywhere between four to eight million Africans that did not go to work or did not go to school and organize activities in conjunction with the march in Washington, because we all couldn't get to Washington. The biggest beneficiary was Bill Clinton. All he did is he came out that Thursday and said, we endorse the message and not the messenger, referring to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Joe Biden is the biggest beneficiary of the George King, I mean, George Floyd uprisings. Also in the scheme of the role of Washington being used as a ice cube to cool down our resistance. That is nothing new. In night, like a lot, the March on Washington, remember we had called on for it as early as 1941, but the reason it happened in 1963 is because in 1959, 
10,000 African students marched on DC saying it had been five years since, since the Brown versus Board of Education. They didn't see anything, any progress, meaningful progress. They came back 26,000 strong the following year, 1960, and 70,000 children and youth went to jail during the sit-ins. So the big six were summoned by President Kennedy to finally have their march on Washington. Um, you see numerous marches on Washington take place when the nation is paranoid about the character of our resistance going over the top. The Million Man March was made possible by the young people who boycotted Virginia Beach after they were massacred by the National Guard, the Rodney King rebellions, a climate that was so nationalist and pan-Africanist that even fraternities and sororities were making kente cloth in their colors. Hip hop artists who couldn't name three African nations had medallions around their neck and were no longer wearing gold ropes. They had a problem. But then all of a sudden, you see the emergence of, um, it starts with Ice Cube's album, America's Most Wanted, and then the career of Tupac Shakur, where we go from embracing Africa, even saying to be called African-American is not enough anymore, to all of a sudden putting a positive acronym in associated with the racial epithet nigger, never ignorant, getting goals accomplished. So that was used against the nationalist and pan-Africanist sentiment that was soaring through our neighborhoods. I remember even seeing one of my childhood friends selling crack with a Nelson Mandela t-shirt on. So even though he was involved in the destruction of his community, he still saw himself connected to the legacy that the African National Congress represents, having the distinction of being the oldest liberation movement we created on the African continent always being in step with the resistance in this country because they had a bus boycott and after Chief Albert Lathuli organizes a bus boycott after seeing um, Montgomery's success. So them being afraid. And then this was a time where we were starting to recognize because Malcolm X was the face of our resistance. We gravitated to him symbolically and we recognized that he was the one that was correct when he said by any means necessary which meant that if you can demonstrate to have your revolution, if your revolution takes on the character of demonstrations, strikes and boycotts, so be it. If it takes on the character of urban rebellion, so be it. If it takes on the character of protected armed struggle, so be it. Where Dr. King felt that nonviolence was a principle, which suggested that guerrilla fighters and those involved in urban rebellions don't want peace, don't want stability, and don't do that for he and don't engage in that activity for humane reasons. So that's why they were very concerned. So that means that we would gravitate to Osage for Kwame and Krumah and the Convention People's Party who won their independence through a positive action campaign. Sequitore and the Democratic Party of Guinea who won their independence through positive action, even though Sequitore's first decision was to arm all of Guinea. First decision, first policy. Uh, or Patrice Lumumba and the Con Congolese National Movement who came through positive action, or Muammar Gaddafi in the September Revolution. But at the same time, we would embrace Eritrea, who fought for 30 years with guns, full-fledged. Embrace Kenya and the Mau Mau, who fought full-fledged. Embrace Algeria, who fought full-fledged. So for us, it's not the character of the resistance, it's the intent of the resistance. So that's so we had elevated to that level of understanding and our action reflected that. So they had to use vulnerable, undisciplined artists against us. They had to use opportunist elected officials against us. They had to use opportunists in the church against us. They had to do everything they could. They were desperate. And at the same time, when we intensified the fight against naked police terrorism, in the United States, military neo-colonialism was dealt a severe blow in Africa. You saw Babanga and Abacha over toppled in Nigeria. You saw Traore, who was used by the CIA to overthrow Modibo Keita in Mali. You saw him over toppled. You saw Samuel Doe in Liberia, over, who, like his other predecessors, had their own rubber plantations working with Firestone. He was over toppled. You saw UNITA destabilize in Angola. 
Renamo destabilizing Angola. So the masses in Africa were saying no more military neocolonialism. Unfortunately, civil co civilian neocolonialism was able to be initiated, but it at least let people know that having militant character was as natural for us as a rooster crowing, and they had a problem, and they had to use culture, they had to use mainstream politics, they had to use Hollywood to stop it and redirect it. So it goes back to, regardless of whatever generation stands up for our people, we must be the beneficiaries of our labor, not the enemies who we're trying to liberate ourselves from in the first place. Right. And I wanted to add one of the other instruments was the was the university, because a lot of the a lot of the organization you want to go ahead and say a little bit more about that. Go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, we we gravit we realized through study that what we were doing, we reignited um, the student youth activism in this country. But and we're connecting it. So we saw ourselves as an extension of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee who they attempt to write out of the civil and human rights movement. I remember Marion Barry's funeral. I felt ashamed being there because I had a personal relationship with him and he was so proud of his time in SNCC. Him being the first um, chairman of SNCC, giving up a uh, PhD program opportunity for chemistry to be part of SNCC. So we saw ourselves as an extension of SNCC we saw ourselves as an extension of the students in the Zania South Africa. We saw ourselves in, as an extension of the University of Havana students. We saw as our, ourselves as an extension of that militant anti-imperialist student resistance and our activity reflected that. And um, so this is why the unit, we, you saw more focus on ROTCs getting pushed back off of campuses. We were the ones as young people who worked with the American Indian Movement Grand Governing Council to get the name of the Washington Redskins changed, to get the name of the Cleveland Indians changed. So we were part of the ignition of that particular effort. We were the youngest entity to be part of the Worldwide African Anti-Zionist Front, which was created in um, Durban, I mean, in um, Libya. So for those of you who do anti-Zionist work, you should know that there was post-Durban work and pre-Durban work. Many of you went to Durban because you were looking at the Zionist question through the lens of the never-ending lovers' quarrel between Democrats and Republicans. But we picked up the mantle to fight the Zionists, the students, and youth because we know that Ethel Minor got the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with her paper, The Palestinian Problem, to stand with the Palestinians. And, they, and she was with Malcolm during his Nation of Islam time, where he had a segment in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper, which he started in his basement as a gift to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad about the Palestinian question. And from there, we were saying that the Zionist question was the tip of the iceberg for us. We were dealing with Israel based on its Africa crimes, bombing Kemet in 67, opposing self-determination for Algeria and Tunisia, supporting German colonialism in Namibia, Portuguese colonialism in Angola and Mozambique, and British and Rhodesian colonialism in Zambia and Zimbabwe, Israel being an enemy. And this is why we have been at the forefront of pushing for Israel to be removed from the African Union's Observer Council, which they have suspended them, but that ain't enough. They are 47 Israeli embassies in Africa, which means that 47 to 55 African nations have normal, warm, embracing relations with the most ruthless white supremacist genocidal government on the planet and that change. And we have used the platform of my father's book that was reintroduced to the public space in December. We would like the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, Cornell West, and now since Harry Belafonte is no more, Mark Lamont Hill to come to Washington and we have a no holds barred conversation about Zionism. Not a debate, but a conversation. That way you have full representation of the spectrum. Cornell West and Mark Lamont Hill would represent the Social Democrats. The Most Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan would represent nationalism and liberation theology, African style. And we would represent 
the nationalist and pan-Africanist sector who are usually excluded from plat discussions of that magnitude. So if the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan does, is not up to it, because we know he's struggling with his help, he can send Wesley Muhammad or Nuri Muhammad to represent him. Mark Lamont Hill is two hours down the street and Dr. Cornell West would come. We think he would. He has no reason to be uh, afraid. He'd be amongst family. He'd be amongst his brothers. So we can have that conversation. So in our capacity as students, this is some. Of, this is the activity that we took on. So if you want to know why we work with Zimbabwe today, if you want to know why we work with Cuba today, oh, and we've been working with the Eritrean People's Liberation Front because the cultural and educational attache who, um, Ferrani Abraham, she was our classmate. So we've been working with the Eritreans since 1990, 1991. We may not look at, this is what people tell us, but we've been around for 33 years and we're in our 50s now and we're fighting like we did in our 40s and our 30s and in our 20s. But at the same time, we're not trying to speak for the Black Lives Matter generation. We're not trying to speak for the woke generation. Even though if they hang around us, we'll turn them into insomniacs for sure. And they'll have to go and get in a new alarm, an alarm clock. But we're not trying to speak for them because we saw in the past where people in their 50s tried to speak for the 90s generation and we did not let them. So in that same vein, we everybody pursues their objectives based on their experiences, based on their exposure, and based on their service. So our activity takes on the character of people who've been around for 33 years and are in their 50s. We don't sound like we're in our 20s. We don't sound like we're in our 30s and we're not supposed to. Right. So it's, it's the continuity that's important. Right. Yes. And that and and one of the things that I wanted to add in this conversation, uh, you know, the Pan-African um, Congress uh, in South Africa was influential. Thank you for bringing them up. Our first activity in, his, in relationship to them is we helped organize the funeral of Zephaniah Motopane, the second longest, the third longest imprisoned fighter in Azania. Jafta Mosamola, the tiger, was first. He did 30. Madiba Nelson Mandela did 27. And Uncle Zeph, as we affect, and let us tell people who Zephaniah Motopeng was. Zephaniah Motopeng is a founding member of the Pan Africanist Congress of Azania, which means he was part of the African National Congress's Youth League contingent that broke away from ANC because they wouldn't deal with the land question and didn't want to take up arms at that time. But because of the success of the Sharpeville Kualanga uprising, which resulted in a massacre between five to 10,000 Africans, not 500 like the capitalist media says, he was summoned by Steve Biko and the leadership of Azapo and the Black Consciousness Movement. And he advised them on how to pull off the Soweto uprising. So we had the honor of organizing his funeral in the diaspora which was at St. Augustine's Church on 14th and V Street. And we worked with the late Dr. Nana Shishibe and her husband, Jerry Shishibe, for many years, who were the DC representatives of the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania. When I used to go to New York between 1990 and 1994, I used to stay in the home of Elizabeth Sebeko, whose husband, David Mapuzana Sebeko, was the foreign minister to the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, who was assassinated in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania by the CIA and European intelligence entities because of the affair of the PAC. And one of my buddy, and one of my dear friends was the son of Mangalizo Sabukwe Dini. He lived up the street from me and we always used to meet and strategize. So we grew up hanging around PAC and Azapo exiles who were in this country and in the DC area. And every year we would help them organize a Kualanga Sharpeville uprising commemoration. And we would help the BCMA and Azapo organize a Steve Biko commemoration. So we worked very, in the 1990s, this is what we were doing. And, and we refused to accept the narrative that the African National Congress was the only organization should, that should be worked with and the only organization that should be championed. Because to us, that was equi the equivalent 
of telling the story of the civil rights and human rights movement through the lens of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference exclusively, which is what a lot of people have the audacity to continue to do. You read my mind with that comment because I was going to talk about, you know, the 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 scope, and I hope our listeners are able to kind of kind of listen and come back because what we've actually uh, uh, attempted to do, and it's just very brief because you know we you know we talk constantly and we're we're developing you know uh, uh, avenues and paths to work to really expand uh, the consciousness, the critical consciousness of folk who engage and listen and move them to actually understanding that there is a there is a tradition and a future path of work that needs to be uh connected and we're standing at that at that connection and the um, only and it, opposition is going to come from the valley of the talking heads which we're going to blow up very soon anyway it has no place it has no purpose right so right. they better enjoy the unlimited time they got left they're on borrowed time and that's not a threat. That's a promise. Right. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Again, Thank it is you. always a always a pleasure to have any type of a conversation or share space with you. Again, as you know, we are connected. This is this is platform is just as much yours as it is everybody else's. Thank until you. the next time, and until very soon, uh, we will be. That's it for Africa Woke Now Project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. Follow us on Twitter at AFWRLDNWPRJ. Instagram at Africa Woke Now Project. Access to our other media platforms can be reached through the bios of our social media. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa Woke Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Moiza Muntali, Africa World Now Project Media Correspondent, Funa Ngonda. Senior Research Content Contributor and Production Director, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui. Senior Research Content Contributor and Production Associate, Dr. Josh Myers. Associate Producer and Content Contributor, Dr. Keisha Khan Perry. Content Contributor and Filmmaker, Kurt Orderson. Technology Advisor, it's Byron Gray of Greyworks Technologies. And Creative Directors, International Creative and Artist Designer, Tabasam Siddiqui and Judah Pope. Africa World Now Project can be heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC, NPR affiliate and broadcast service of Winston-Salem State University. Programs are archived and available on all podcast platforms. Search Africa World Now Project. Until next week, be safe, be peaceful, and above all, be intelligent. Be intelligent.